Thank you. Um, it's a true pleasure for me to be here to, today, and I really would like to thank the organizer for inviting me and uh, basically for this wonderful event over the past few days. I also would like to thank all of you, all of you who have come over the past few days and have approached me to talk about how the textbooks have been written have impacted and inspired their career. As an educator, this is really uh, something that I treasure a lot. And I really appreciate you for basically uh, responding to that. Thank you. So you've had two days of technical presentations with a lot of depth. And for this presentation, I decided to do somewhat different and basically maybe go a little bit philosophical. Think a little bit about how computing and humans basically fit together. So I call it of brains and computers. We have been living with computers for a long time. Right? Um, we had abacus already from uh, the ancient times, but it's really in the years 1800 approximately that the first mechanical computers came. And what we've seen since then is a true revolution. Every 10 years, we see devices to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And at the same time, in parallel, we've seen these devices becoming, becoming connected together in larger and larger networks uh, of millions to billions and soon to be trillions of connected devices. So all of this has been made possible by a number of things. As you can see again, we have reduced the size of a computer over the age of about 40 years, 60 years approximately, by about, uh, if you look at the numbers, tens of orders of magnitude. That's amazing. Now, as you know, a lot of this was enabled by the whole concept of Moore's law that made transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. So while this has been going on, we have actually seen another set of computers walking around on this earth for a while as well. Actually, a lot longer. Um, actually, the first uh, biological computers arose around 500 million years ago when the first neural networks emerged and then gradually became more and more complex, formed networks of neurons, ultimately leading to the production or the creation of the forebrain and the, the brains that we basically know of today. Uh, those devices were not connected. Well, they were. Actually, as humanity, we have been, one of the strengths of humanity has been the capability of communication, where we have, were capable of explaining and changing abstract ideas to each other, and that really has helped to build our culture over the years. Now, if you look at that, you see actually that the trend in the biological computer space is the opposite of what we've seen in the electronic computing world. Actually, the brain, since the um, uh, start, basically, and definitely since the beginning of the cognitive revolution that happened around 70,000 years ago, we've seen that the size of the brain has grown actually quite dramatically. Uh, another Moore's law in a certain sense. Even though what I've heard is that as of recent, since let's say about uh, 10,000 years ago, the growth of the brain has stopped and actually has become smaller again. Um, and there's some particular reason how you can explain this. So those things have happened in parallel. And the question is, obviously, can they learn from each other? Can they basically influence each other? Now, the two types of computers I'm talking about are very different. They have different goals. If you look at your uh, physical computers, they were built to solve problems, solve algorithms, execute algorithms by performing a set of sequential steps. And we built computers to maximize performance while minimizing energy and cost. The brain, on the other hand, has a completely different function. It was basically built with one mission. It is to survive, prosper, 
and procreate. That's kind of the primary mission of what brains were. And since then, we've been layering layers of abstraction on top of that. Now, to do so, it follows a set of closed-loop feedback loops. On one side, we observe the outside world. We have senses, and with that, we basically observe patterns that we then put together into more and more complex patterns that we then compare to things we have learned, stored patterns. We compare it with experience we have, and based on that, we make decisions and output actions that then gradually get redefined into smaller actions as well and make us walk, speak, and do all this type of things. Now, you have to be aware that there's another part of the brain which is just as important. It is the part that keeps us alive. It is the inner loop that basically measures what's happening in our body, the metabolism and the physiology. And based on that, based on that observation, it basically again goes to patterns, compares it with situations it knows of, and performs output actions. Like for instance, suddenly it realizes I'm hungry and it's time to go and eat, for instance, as an example. So here again, we have a particular set of goals to optimize. And here, for humans at least, it is to maximize reward. That's the way we live while doing this at a minimum energy cost. Really important because gathering energy has always been one of the tasks that has been very hard and basically has taken a lot of time for humanity. Now, the approaches to solving those problems are also fundamentally different. In the physical world, we have adopted this concept of the instruction set machine, the concepts that basically were forwarded by Turing and uh, von Neumann and so on and so forth, where we sequentially execute a set of instructions to perform a certain task. The biological world, on the other hand, has been based on learning. By observing, we basically create patterns, we store those patterns, we combine them, we update them all the time, and so on and so forth. So a learning-based paradigm versus an instruction-based paradigm. There's other differences. If you look at the brain in itself, it's a very parallel machine. It's a machine that basically operates in a spatial-temporal space. Um, Functions only get fired when needed. Most of the time, our brain is idle and performing only some basic functions. It's only when the right patterns get presented that we basically perform and basically certain regions of the brain basically get excited. On the other hand, our physical computers are based on a very regimented timing engine where you basically have clocks determine exactly about when things have to happen and what sequence have to happen. And actually, a lot of our energy goes in that timing regime and basically in enforcing that particular timing structure. Now, there's some sad news to it, though. Sad or good, as you have heard over the last couple of days, both of those approaches have some limits. In the world of uh, semiconductor, we've seen that that scaling thing that has brought us smaller and smaller computers is definitely slowing down. There's no question about it. We're going to do 5 nanometers. We're going to do 3 nanometers. We're going to do 2 nanometers. Are we going to do 1 nanometer? Not entirely sure about that at all. On the other hand, getting smarter brains is getting harder as well. Uh, there's a couple of options. You can increase your brain size, like we did in the past, obviously, uh, is one option. We can put more neurons in there, which means that you have to make them smaller. Uh, you can make them faster, uh, increase the signaling speed. Or you can make more complex neurons and have more connection between those. But all of those come at a cost, which is quite substantial. It slows the problem. A bigger brain gets slower because you have to travel over longer distances. All of those approaches typically going to require more energy. And I already mentioned that energy is a very important part. And if you make your neurons too small, they become very noisy and they make a lot of errors. 
So there's limitations in this space as well. So the question is now how to move forward. What are the options to move forward? Okay. Now, as I already said, energy is the limiting factor. If you look at the number of the neurons in the brain and you combine this and you map it on the amount of glucose you have to take in, you see that there's a very strong relationship. If I basically want to have a bigger brain with more neurons, I have to have more food. And again, that basically is a big drain on uh, the resources of humanity. On the other side, if you look at the sizes of the devices we're building, be it cell phones, be it smart watches, and you look at how much of basically that device is taken for storage of energy, it's quite amazing. By the way, I just forgot to mention about this part as well. If you look at the human body and you think about it, how much of our body is dedicated to basically intake food, process food, and generate energy? Actually, it's a big fraction of our complete body. So energy is a driving factor. It's also the limiting factor. Uh, again, the amount of effort I can perform in my brain is determined by how much heat I can take out. Heat is taken out by the capillary system. And actually, our brain is a very sensitive device. It has to operate between about 36 and 37 and a half degrees Celsius to be fully operational. You get out of that range, you'll be in trouble. And the heat removal we can do is about 15 milliwatt per centimeter cube. Actually, if you would produce more heat, you basically will get out of those boundaries and actually the brain will adjust. You notice probably when you do too much multitasking, you start seeing that the axis starts to slow down automatically. It is that heat removal function that kicks in and says, that's there's only so much things I basically can do. Um, and the same is obviously true with our integrated circuits. The more we pack, the more heat we take out. And if you start doing all those beautiful stacking of devices that we've been talking about the last couple of days, you start seeing that actually that heat removal problem becomes more and more complicated, and we need very specialist specialized techniques to do so. So, what's the opportunity? Where can we go? And I believe that the opportunity is to learn from both spaces and see if there's some convergence to be had, some cross-contamination. And my claim is it is already happening. Here's an example of a computer. What we have done, we've taken the computer, we added legs to it, added sensors to it, and we call it a robot. And again, this is the evolution of where we basically take some of these ideas of how humans are built and basically start mapping into the physical computing world. That's one example. On the other hand, what we have started to do is surround ourselves as humans with a variety of electronic devices be it cell phones, smartphones, and things like that, AR, VR devices, and so on and so forth, that give us new capabilities. Extended memory and all those type of things. So in a sense, we are already cross-correlating between the two domains. Now, on the type of numbers, if you look at the number gain, we see some convergence as well. A typical brain has about 80 billion neurons all packed in a volume of about one and a half liters and uh, about consuming 20 watts on average. That's the average rate. If you look at the latest processors that we have been creating, this is a Xilinx Versal FPGA from uh, last year. Uh, basically 37 billion transistors. The numbers start to become similar in terms of number of neurons, number of transistors. Power is definitely higher. Performance, about 100 tops, that are ops per second. Now, the brain still can do more. If you look at it, we're still not there yet. But again, we see that convergence of numbers that says, hey, we're somewhere on a convergence path. There's another form of convergence that has happened kind of silently over the years. I already mentioned the brain is a temporal engine where data or particular parts of the brain only get fired, only get activated when the right patterns get presented. Right? Very data-driven. We only turn on the processor when you need the data. Now, if I look at our microprocessor, it used to be the different 
type of thing in the past, what we had is a processor, and we tried to keep it busy, busy as much as possible, and we built a memory structure around it to keep it as busy as we could. But then we started putting four processors on a die, eight processors on a die, 16, thousands, and so on and so forth. And what you now start seeing is that we are moving to a similar model. Actually, processors, memory and processors are getting intertwined. And we only turn on the processor when you need the data. So the concept of dark processors is something that basically is somewhat inspired or similar to what you see happening in the brain. So again, a form of convergence. Now what I'm going to do next is trying to understand a little bit more how some of the concepts that the brain has been using for a long period of time could be used to help us to forward and basically make our next generation computers more effective. So some lessons from the brain. Now, um, I have to put a caveat here. Uh, the understanding of the brain is still very limited. We learn a lot. The, the last decade has been the age of discovery in the brain because of new imaging techniques. So my friend Bruno also tells me that biology is hiding its secrets very well. We just don't have the right tools yet to grasp it. But what's happening is we're building these tools as we stand. Now, what, uh, at the same time, while this is true, I believe there are some concepts of neural systems that are well understood. Actually, I'm going to quote a number of things from this beautiful book, and I invite you to read it. It's called Principles of Neural Design. It's actually a neuroscientist almost acting like an engineer and trying to figure out what are the basic concepts that drive it and basically how basically have they helped and developed over the ages. So here's uh, principle number one. I'm going to have five principles. Principle number one is kind of a bizarre one for people who are working in the electronic world. It says, compute with chemistry whenever possible. Now that sounds strange, but I'm going to translate a little bit. It says, use the right signaling approach that matches the type of function you want to perform. Now, some of you who know me know that I have been kind of driven by this, or uh, one of the biggest inspirations of all my research is trying to see how close I can get to this magical number of KTLN2. KTLN2 is the minimum level of energy a operation can take. Well, turns out that nature has figured out how to do this quite nicely. If you look at chemical computing using proteins, uh, actually proteins are amazing elements. They're the basic building blocks of how we operate as a human and, as, uh, and beyond that in the animal world, plants and so on and so forth. You see that protons are actually computers. You can do anything with them. You can do amplification, oscillation, integration, you can actually do digital operations and add, subtract, and so on and so forth. And they do this at amazingly low energy levels. If you think about the opening of an ion channel in a synapse of a neuron, it takes 75 kT. That's as close as anything I've seen in reality to my KTLN2 number. It's only two orders of magnitude away. And once you open that channel, then obviously you can do interesting things. Energy starts flowing and we actually can have much faster responses. It has some problems, though. It is darn slow. Here we're talking about things that are acting in milliseconds to minutes to hours, way slower than the processor we know of today. And it's also very noisy. The closer you get to this KTLN2, it's basically thermodynamics you're talking about is going to be very noisy. But we'll come back to that uh, later, how you can address this. So if I look at the trade-offs I have in terms of computing, on one side you have speed, on the other side I have energy. Right? If I want to go to the very low energy space, as I said, chemical makes a lot of sense. Actually, the cheapest thing to do is what we call chemical broadcast. You take a, a pill, let's say, you inject it in your bloodstream, it goes everywhere in your body, basically for free. 
is the most effective way to broadcast and have computation that covers a big area. But again, it takes minutes to hours. And then you go to the local chemistry, protein computing, analogs. Actually, neurons use an analog, basically, it's the voltages to propagate signals. And if it's too slow, they go over to spiking, spiking neural nets. And finally, we can go to the digital space where we get into the nanoseconds realm, but at energy levels which are orders of magnitude higher. So it's that trade-off game you have to play. Not everything has to run at gigahertz, which is going to lead actually to my second principle in a second. So in our physical world, we can learn a little bit from this. For instance, if you take this idea, this is work from uh, Philip Wong with his uh, RM implement, uh, vertical RM represent, uh, implementation. If we start thinking about non-volatile memory, RM, what you do is you change some material, you use some material properties to ingrain something into your circuit that can stay there for a long period of time. Very cheap from an energy perspective. Once it's there, it sticks there. It's an example of how we actually can use some chemistry or basically material science capabilities to make computation a lot cheaper. And we can do trade-offs in our designs as well. Not everything has to be digital. If I only need a very low SNR, actually analog is a much better solution. It might be noisy, it might be variable, but again, we can deal with that with other means. And um, again, if you look at communication, actually for low SNR, things like pulse-based type systems can be performing uh, in a much more effective way, giving me about 20, uh, a factor of 10, one order to two orders of magnitude in savings. So again, be broad-minded on how you implement functions. This can help a lot. Now, the second one, a principle is something that our 5G people won't like. Um, it basically says, send only information that is needed and do it as slowly as possible. This is the opposite of what our industry has been doing for the last 20, 30 years or so. But it is obviously a, a piece of truth. We're sending way too much information, and we're sending at too fast a rate. Again, nature has basically been optimizing this. This is a, some cross-sections of the optical nerve that goes between our nose, the olfactory system, the eyes, the optical system, and the auditory system, it's our ears. And what you see is there's actually quite fundamental differences. The nose can be very slow. A smell is not something that changes at nan nose nanosecond rate, it's slow. So you can basically afford to have very tiny, very slow wires to connect those. And as a result of that, the energy that you use to do this transmission is very low. On the other hand, uh, the auditory system has to be really fast. Uh, having basically 3D audio requires very quick response at rates of milliseconds. And as you can see here, we have thick wires, thick axons, that are taking a lot more energy performed but are a lot faster. So the customization to the needs and the function at hand is very important. Now think about the same thing about our digital world or in our computing world. Um, the cost of transmitting a bit wirelessly is very expensive. Actually, for a single Bluetooth LE, it's somewhere right here, BTLE, transmitting a single bit uh, using your Bluetooth radio is equal to 10 million digital operations. So you can do a lot of computation without basically doing the computation. What it basically tells me is try to move your computation as close as possible to the source and only transmit relevant data, not the raw data overall. And again, the brain has figured this out. If you look at the optical system, we have an amazing set of sensors in our eyes, 130 million photoreceptors that then connect basically through the optical nerve to your visual cortex that has multiple layers, multiple abstractions, very similar to our neural networks of today. But the first thing the eye does 
The retina does is extract features. It doesn't transmit raw data. It extracts features and reduces the amount of information that is transmitted to the brain substantially. The whole bandwidth is on about 10 to 100 megabits per second in total. Actually, you should realize that what you see or what you think you see is something that is reconstructed in your brain. We don't transmit your raw video to the brain. We reconstruct the image. That's why some people might see very different things of the same type of picture. Now, send information that's only that is needed. Here's another example, for instance. We have our body is covered by a couple of square meters of tactile sensors. It's our skin. And most of the skin doesn't do very much most of the time. It's only when you have a certain touch or when there's certain type of uh, 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 events happening that you basically create events. And rather than transmitting continuously, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, what happens here is that you can only transmit information when a particular sensor gets triggered. And then you can easily multiplex these things over a single wire at a very low data rate, and you get a very effective type of system. This is actually a, a artificial skin approach that was basically developed at NUS. Same thing with video. Um, what we keep on doing is taking a complete frame of video, transmitting it out. Actually, more and more we start seeing cameras emerging that only transmit changes. It's only when an event happens on a pixel that we should transmit it. Again, a lot more efficient. It's going to save energy. It's going to make our device a lot more effective. Principle number three, to conserve space, time, and energy, new information should be stored at the site where it's processed and from where it can be recalled. What it basically says that our traditional microprocess approach is totally wrong. Right? Uh, what we need to do is intersperse memory, logic, and sensing. They all come together into one. And that's the way we get the efficiency that we basically would like to desire. Again, you see that nature has done this very nicely. This is a cross-section of both uh, the visual system as well as the olfactory system. We have lots of sensors. First thing we do is process, reduce, use sparsity, compress, and then we transmit it out to the brain where it basically gets expanded and put in many, 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 many places both in the visual cortex and the olfactory cortex. And what it does there is make sure that the data is where you need it. Store the data close to your processor so you don't have to shuffle things back and forth continuously. And we can do this today. You heard Max this morning talking about the amazing capabilities of what we can do with 3D stacking. We actually can now start interspersing logic memory, sensing all together. We can do this using a variety of approaches. Could be done also in flexible and ten flexible type of fabrics, where, for instance, artificial skin with embedded processing, embedded memory, all those type of things are becoming possible in the technologies of today. Now, the last two uh, um, uh, principles um, are kind of something that I kind of make up. The first one is complicate. Now, that sounds weird, right? Complicated is never a good thing. Now, neuroscientists kind of read this in a different way. When I mean complicated, I mean customize. Uh, and actually, there's a beautiful statement. If, if one design is simple and another one is complicated, use a complicated one. Which really means, say, use a device or a circuit that is dedicated to that function. Right? So, again, if you look at the structure of the brain, that's what we've done. Even though people say, well, it's all built out of neurons, but you see that various places the neurons are very different. They're differently sized, the, size, the length is different, the axons are different, the interconnectedness is very different. And that's why you have all those various regions in the brain doing particular functions. And there's way more than the cortex, by the way. We think, talk mostly about the cortex, but there's other areas like the cerebellum and so on and so forth, the cerebrum, all those type of things, are all basically optimized to perform certain functions and are very dedicated to those functionalities. 
Again, we have learned from that. If I look at the current day SOCs that go into your cell phone, we see that they're not a homogeneous type of structure. Yes, they're all built from transistors, but there's no things that do uh, AI functionality. You have processors, you have a bunch of I.O. interfaces, you have video processor, you have all those kind of type of things all combined together. So we start seeing again that some of those concepts are now appearing in our SOC space as well. Now here's an interesting one of complication. Uh, this is a picture of a little tiny worm, which is called C. elegans. It's the smallest real neural network you can imagine. It's about 300 neurons. And uh, what they do is make that worm move and get food. Basic concept, right? Now, if you look at those 300 neurons, each of them is a neuron with a certain particular name on them. They're placed very specifically. They all have a specific location. Now, if you feed, if you basically look at the connectivity between those and the input-output function they have to perform, what you realize, when you actually feed this into a CAT optimization program that would find the optimal placement, you will see that nature has actually come up with the optimal placement for every one of those neurons. It is exactly where it should be to minimize wire length and again become more energy efficiency. So this is an ex interesting example of nature had basically performing certain optimization function. My last two principles are number one is play the number game. Play the number game is basically statistics. If you have something which is extremely noisy, as I explained, like our ion channels, they basically are sitting at the edge of the SNR of one. Basically, signal and noise are approximately the same. The reason you get meaningful signals of them is you put a lot of them in parallel and you use averaging and ultimately out of that comes real signal. Same thing happens in your nose. We have about a million sensors in our nose which are all basically molecular sensors that basically are coded to basically decipher or couple to a set of molecules that are in the air and that basically you smell. Now, the type of uh, receptors we're using, those sensors actually are really lousy sensors. They're not very sensitive. Uh, well, they might be sensitive, but they're not very selective. One might sense molecule one, two, and three. The other one, something else. Um, and actually, by the way, you know, they're pretty cheap. They're my, again, the sensitivity might vary quite substantially. The variability might be huge. Still, we as humans, and especially some animals like dogs and things like that, are amazing in picking out particular molecules. And the way they do that is play the number game. Basically, you have enough of those, you combine it together, you get a picture that emerges, and that's very precise. Again, something that we can think about when we start building more complex type of interfaces with the real world. And finally, I think is one of the more important ones. We as humans are basically continue, continuously doing this self-calibration. Uh, we adapt continuously. Changing conditions will uh, uh, force, basically, uh, basically help us to reconstruct, uh, basically reconfigure our brain. And we also do healing. This is something that our integrated circuits don't do very well yet. Um, they basically, once they fail, that's it. So something to think about. Because self-calibration, helps us to deal with components that can be a lot lower energy and when we tune them effectively based on observation, learning experience, and so on and so forth. So again, again, it can lead to systems that are a lot more effective. Again, this is how the human system does it. We basically have continuously observations of all the different functions that are happening. Uh, we see if viruses come in, we detect those, we basically build systems that react to them. So there's a set of circles here that locally try to correct it, but there's also the big picture. Uh, somewhere the brain knows the tasks at hand. It says, oh, I need food. I am going to be hungry in an hour from now because I've been working really hard. So there's some intent in there. We have some knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. So, for instance, here's an example of how we actually can turn a sensor 
which might be, again, not the best sensor into something that's always optimal. Or I, if you look at the retina, is not an equally distributed set of quality sensors. There's the area which is called the fovea, where we have the highest resolution of, of imagers, and where the quality and the resolution is higher than the edges of your eye. Now, obviously, you would like to always use that center part. So what we do is we have a motor function, the ocular motor, motor, uh, the ocular motor here, that basically moves your eyes. Basically, and make sure that you position them in the right position. And you can do this in two ways. You can do this by local observation. You look at something and you adjust locally, tiny little adjustments. But even more importantly, we can use intent. We know, or your brain knows, I'm going to look in that direction. So it can start pre-orienting that motor in that direction. This is done in an area which is called the colliculus. So again, you can make a system work a lot better if you have that feedback loop over many layers going all the way from this small bottom physical layer all the way up to the highest level. And this is way how you would translate it into circuitry, right? You have sensors, you have signal condition conversion. In the end, you have a digital processor. The digital processor can help you to calibrate all those units and making sure they're always oriented or basically optimized for that particular position. So these are my key principles that I think are, that, and there's many more, by the way, but some key principles that help us think about how the brain, and maybe how we can build a next generation of integrated circuits that perform better. Now, I would like to end this with some what I call late evening musings. So it's obviously uh, getting later in the evening. Some more philosophy. Is it time for a new Moore's law? Well, nature has done an amazing job. Evolution has found in the biological human brain a system that I claim is close to optimal. And both it balances size, power budget, cell complexity, wiring density, and so on and so forth. Given the size of the brain, yeah, it packed it very nicely, does a great job. Now, given our knowledge about physics, materials, nano devices, noise and energy constraints, can't we find a optimal solution for a physical computer? Couldn't we do something like that? An interesting, interesting challenge to think about. And I think in certain conditions you can. However, you might ask, is this too simplistic a question to ask? Because what I did is drop out one extra element here. Is this optimal for what? Right? And ultimately, the brain has been optimized for dealing with an environment around us. That's why we have the speech of the sensor, and so on and so forth. You can only answer this question if you also have that definition. What is the input-output? What is the environment your system is put in? Now, somewhat we know this. Um, but before going there, there's actually a problem that we see in that previous picture, is that there's also a great disconnect. Um, if you think about the ratio between frequencies, performance, between our organic computer and our physical computer, we see that's about a factor 10 to the 6. So that's why some people are getting worried that if computers are getting more and more intelligent and faster and things like that, they might outpace our brains and humans altogether and nature altogether. Right? That's one of the scary have. Would a world filled up with computers something where we humans are always running behind? And again, I think that's a wrong proposition. I think the great disconnect is not really there if you think about the fact that all those systems have to deal with nature. Deal with not only nature, but the people around us, the society around us, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of the picture you have to have imagined, where you basically indeed have electronics that are actually interacting with the world around us. We have extra senses we can add to our humans. They can connect to our brain, so we create connectivity, brain-machine interfaces that allow that physical computer to talk to your organic computer. We have wireless links that allow humans now directly to communicate with each other where they do that. 
but you can imagine now that brains could connect to each other as well. And by the way, all those type of things can connect to the cloud as well, where you might have massive amount of data, massive amount of things. And the pace of the information will scale. It's not everything is one is this speed, one is the other speed. No, that won't happen. And by the way, we can do this with our little robots and automatic driving cars and so on and so forth as well. So this leads to this world where we have true convergence. I believe that humanity and computing, as physical computing, are bound to basically converge and basically be complementary, uh, basically complement each other going forward. So that's kind of what my key conclusion is of this presentation. The message I want to give, uh, basically give away, actually, I believe that those things will be more and more co-joined and evolve together. Now, one last thing before we leave, one final irony. Um, we have been talking a lot about AI these days, about learning-based systems and so on and so forth. But if I start looking further into biology and you go deeper and deeper and look into your neuron, you actually see that we are basically made of instruction set computers. Because our DNA, basically the way it is, and the way our RNA and protein destruct, is basically an instruction set device. It's statistical, but it's an instruction set device. So that's the big irony of basically you think about brains and learning based system, but you go back to the core and you go back into overall circle. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.